Let's take our Bibles and look together in Jeremiah chapter 25. And I'll read um, verse 1 down to verse 29. This particular reading. Here we read the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. If you remember, Jehoiakim was one of the last kings of Judah that reigned before Nebuchadnezzar came and conquered Jerusalem. And destroyed temple. This would have been somewhere around 605 before Christ, if you're keeping track. And here specifically, when it says that it was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, this is when he would have taken over and begun to reign himself in Babylon. So it gives us a little bit of historic perspective here. But now here's a interesting, as we continue to read with regard to Jeremiah, it says, The which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me. And I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. This would be then giving us an indication that to this point, Jeremiah had been prophesying and preaching for 23 years. And this would be right around the halfway mark, the entire time that the Lord gave to Jeremiah to prophesy. Remember, he lived through the Babylonian invasion, and actually the Lord directed him down to Egypt, where he remained the remainder of days. But he's given us an indication here of how the Lord had directed him, that you know, even in spite of their unbelief. Think about the number of years that the Lord has enabled me to preach the gospel, that there has been some encouragement, at least over these 30 plus years since the Lord first taught me the gospel, that there have been those elect from different places around the world where the Lord has directed me to preach and it's been an encouragement to my heart. But imagine Jeremiah, imagine Isaiah preaching where the Lord said, they'll hear, but they won't hear. That shouldn't change in any way the message or determination of a prophet or a preacher to exalt God even in the face of unbelief. And that's what he says here. Ye have not hearkened in the verse 3. The word hearkened means they don't have ears to hear. He's preaching to deaf ears. Because only the Lord can open ears. But nonetheless, he declares the truth. In verse 4, And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants the prophets. This indicates that this goes back even before Jeremiah. He's referring to the Elijahs and the Elishas and all those in their history that the Lord raised up prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. And that's the way it's always going to be until God's pleased to open hearts. So in verse 5, they said, Turn ye again now, everyone from his evil way. This was the message of the prophets. This is what it is to preach repentance. It's a turning from one's evil way. And notice it's in the singular. There's only one way that's evil, and that is everything summed up in it. 
because anything that's not the righteousness of God in Christ is an evil way. And from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. This is the message of these prophets, that they continue to call on the people to repent. Repentance is not an invitation. Repentance is a command. And that's how it's set forth. If they said, turn ye again now. Everything. We have no other message but to declare that. And when it says to turn from the evil of your doings, another way of reading that would be the works of your own hands, the evil of their doings was nothing but idolatry, false worship. They said, you have not listened to me. And the message was, go not after other gods to serve them. We've seen this all the way through Scripture. What is it that God detests more than any other sin? It is that of idolatry. And to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands. There it is again, that idolatry. Anything that man makes or comes up with, whether it's physical hands or even in his own imagination, it's idolatry. The reality is, had they repented, then they would not know hurt. That's true. That it's some repentance as the Spirit gives in turning to Christ, even faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we find that that sin has been put away in Christ. It's not our repenting that puts away the sin, but it's the Spirit of grace that turns hearts to Christ. But where that is not true, then there's nothing but condemnation. <clears throat> Yet ye have not hearkened unto me saith the Lord, that he might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. A lot of people like to try to blame God and say, well, if God doesn't grant a repentance, then you know, God's at fault. Remember what Paul wrote there to the Romans, who are you, O man, that you should contest against God, that the clay, the clay should say to the potter, what, what doest thou? Why makest thou thus? God's sovereignty, save whom he will, and he condemns whom he will. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, notice he calls him my servant. How's he God's servant? Well, to execute his judgments. It wasn't that. Nebuchadnezzar was converted, but he was God's servant to execute this judgment upon this people. And they were the families of the north. Nebuchadnezzar was part of a, a ruling family. And it was the Lord that gave strength and power to Babylon at this time. This would be modern day Iraq. And will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about. So it wasn't just Israel, but all the nations around. God, who's the sovereign God and the ruler of nations, was going to give all these nations round about into his hand. He says, I will utterly destroy them, make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolation. Today, with television cameras, with cell phones, you can see some of the luxury that goes on in war, and it's right there in front of your face, and it's abhorrent to see. But I don't believe that we've seen anything today like what the Lord purposed to completely ravage this nation of Israel in their day. Nebuchadnezzar was a ruthless king. Nobody stood in his way, and God purposed it that way to execute his judgment. Not one more was condemned for what God purposed should be condemned, but also remember there was a remnant. In the middle of all this, God brought Daniel and his friends out of destruction and preserved them alive. And Jeremiah. Jeremiah would live to see this. That's why when you read the book of Lamentations, 
That's what it's all about, the destruction that he saw, the ravaging, corpses that could not even be buried, that the birds would come and eat, peck the meat off. He said, moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness. What's that? That's all business. People going about their business, getting married, giving in marriage, acting like nothing was, and all of a sudden, that's what it says here, the voice of the bridegroom, voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, and the light of the candle, darkness. So devastating would be this destruction. It would be complete silence. You wouldn't even hear the millstones. There was nothing to grind. And this whole land shall be a desolation. And there it is again, used a second time, an astonishment. The only way you could describe this is that God turned loose this King Nebuchadnezzar on this people because of their idolatry. The scriptures say the wrath of God abides upon men today. It's because they're alive and going to work and having successful livelihood doesn't mean that they're exempt from wrath. If Christ hasn't paid their sin death, that wrath abides and it will be manifest in the day of judgment. Here is the portion that Daniel was reading. Remember Daniel chapter 9 when we were studying? He was praying and reading the prophet Jeremiah, which is 2 through 19. We studied that. And, and he realized that the 70 years that Jeremiah was talking about was just about up. That's what it says here. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. You can circle Daniel 9, verse 2. That's what Daniel was reading when he realized and began to seek the Lord as to how these things would unfold. This is what he was reading. And notice that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their name and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it Notice, perpetual desolation. See, this is what Habakkuk was troubled by because Habakkuk would have lived during this time too and when God said he was going to raise up the Chaldeans. Habakkuk wondered how it was God could take an evil nation to punish Israel. But then he sat in his tower and waited for the Lord to answer. And even to Habakkuk, it was revealed that yes, he would use the Babylonians for a time but then would bring destruction on the Babylonians. But here's the difference in God's judgments. You realize that God purposed the judgment of Israel to be just for a season. And then he was going to bring them back into the land because he had purposed to bring from this tribe of Judah his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So for Christ's sake, it was impossible that he should destroy perpetually the nation of Israel. But look at the languages used here in verse 12 with regard to the Chaldeans. As he says, when, it, when the 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon. How did he do that? Well, he brought in Darius. He brought in the Medes and the Persians. But so devastating was the destruction of Babylon at that time. Here he says, he would make it perpetual desolations. Never again has Babylon, no matter how powerful it was at that time, in that day, has it ever been again a world power. You can say, well, Iraq is still there, yeah, but Babylon is The ruins are there. You can go over and see some of the ruins. But God purposed to utterly destroy that nation, just like he did with the Medes and the Persians eventually. And then ultimately the Greek Empire and then the Roman, as the Lord revealed to name. But he said, I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. You might say, Well, I thought Jeremiah was right. He is, but he's using himself in the third person here, realizing that it's, it's the Lord who's the author. 
many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. God is sovereign over all nations and uh, exercises his judgments as he will. Then we get to verses 15 and 16 where the Lord describes his judgments as a cup of fury. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at mine hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. So here the wine cup of fury is a description of God's judgment as if Jeremiah now is going to be the bartender. Take this cup of wine of my purity and give it to the nations to drink. There's several places in the Old Testament where that cup is used as a powerful picture of the wrath and judgment of God. Stop and think for a minute about the cup which our Lord in the garden prayed that were it possible, that he wasn't praying that the cup be removed, but he said, even if it were possible, nevertheless not my will but thine be done. That's what he said to his father. That's the cup of the fury of God's wrath that the Lord Jesus Christ would endure on the cross on behalf of his people. The same description. But here, it's used with regard to not just Israel, but all the nations around. And they shall drink and be removed and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. When it says be mad, it's, it's really in the sense of being drunk. Once they're done drinking this, they're going to stagger like a madman, staggering under the effect or the intoxication of this fury. So we find Jeremiah here, doing as the Lord said, then took I the cup at the Lord's hand. He said, well, how did he take the cup? Well, through his prophesying, through his preaching. See, when you preach this word, there's a message of condemnation as well as a message of salvation, but it's, it's the message that he had declared, and he made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me, to which Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation and astonishment a hissing and a curse as it is this day. So the curse was already there. But now even more evident as time approached. But not just Jerusalem. He mentions verse 18 Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. That's where this judgment would begin. And they would begin to drink of the cup of God's fury. That's where Nebuchadnezzar went in and, and took city after city. But also, at the same time, you see there Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And here, Jeremiah begins a list of judgments mentioning Egypt, which at one time was a world power as well. Think of back when Egypt had Israel in captivity. And it was when God purposed that Pharaoh should let Israel go to the Passover land. All of this is God's doing. But he speaks of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and his servants, and his princes, and all, all his people, and all the mingled people, and all the kings of the land of Uz, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, and Ashkelon, and Aza and Ekron and the remnant of Ashdod. These were all cities in Canaan. Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon and all the kings of Tyrus and all the kings of Zidon and the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea, Dedan and Tema and Buzz and all that are in the utmost corners. In other words, no hiding. God would turn his fury on these nations, all of them because they were idolatrous as well. All the kings of Arabia. It's interesting we see these names here. We have Saudi Arabia today. They're all descendants of Ishmael, when you consider it. And all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the desert. And all the kings of Zimri, 
and all the kings of Elam and all the kings of, of the Medes, all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth. And the king of Shishak shall drink after them. Notice the order. It was determined not by Nebuchadnezzar, but the order would be according to how God purposed. These would drink after these others. Be brought to judgment. And therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because the sword which I will send among you. Quite picturesque language when you consider it, but such is the wrath of God. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup of thine hand to drink, then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. Even though they had been rebellious and would not hear, the Lord said, you're not escaping this job. This is an appointment they would keep. The people, if they have an appointment, many times they'll think, well, I don't have to keep that appointment. Well, this one they did keep. The Lord purposed it. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city, which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished, in other words, Jerusalem was no different or better than these other nations that were around them. Ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. What a, what a portion of scripture. Notice how it ends there, the Lord of hosts. That's who he is. This is a God this world doesn't know, and yet... The entire world is in his hands to do with as he will. We'll stop there. Precious Father, I thank you for your word and how picturesque it is to describe for us your wrath and your pleas to pour it out on sinners. We know that we deserve no better, but if it please you that we might be of that remnant, that the Lord Jesus Christ came we paid that sin down. That is your grace. I pray that as we continue to read your word, that we will be smitten with who you are and your holiness and justice. And by your spirit, you continue to grant us repentance toward you and even faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And cause us to be faithful declaring this word in our generation. I will give you all the praise and honor and glory in Christ's precious name.